Hi, everyone. Um, I hope all of you had a great holiday season and that you're having a good year so far. And um, we have some exciting programs coming up um, for our club this year. And so I'll just tell you about a few of them. Um, in February, we're going to have Connie Kohlmeyer from the Conservation Foundation present Mushrooms at Home. And then in March, um, Pat Cosmic, who's a master gardener with the University of Illinois Extension, will present seed starting, um, giving your garden a head start. And then April, Nancy Bell, who is a master gardener with the University of Illinois Extension, will present beneficial insects garden warrior, warriors. And then we're going to have in May, Corey Belgalka present invasive plants. And then in June, we'll have Marcy um, Rally from the Bat Backyard Patch Herbs. She'll present crafting herbal mo uh, mocktails. And then um, in July, we're going to get to tour the amazing permaculture permaculture garden in Ron and Vicki Nowicki's um, yard. And then next month, hopefully we can um, let you know what the rest of the programs are going to be for the rest of the year. Our speaker tonight is John Cibula, who is an educator, writer, and naturalist. Um, nature, especially birds, insects, and reptiles, have always played a big role in his life. John is a longtime active member of the DuPage Birding Club, um, for which he has served as field trip coordinator and outreach and education coordinator and has presented many programs on a variety of birding topics. He also volunteers um, for the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County, where his work has included surveying nesting birds, butterflies, dragonflies, amphibians, and reptiles. And tonight he's going to present on feeding birds in winter. And now I'm going to hand this over to John. First thing I do is unmute. Well, it's it's a pleasure um, to be here. Um, okay, we're and we're seeing. Uh, let's see. Do I can I see share screen? Yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure uh, to be here tonight with the Page Organic Gardening Club. Uh, I think I addressed you once before at the library in Carroll Stream. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. Uh, Laura needs to make you co-host to share. There, there it goes. Okay, and I'm going to hit play. So, when I prepared this program, who thought it'd be so winter, right? Um, but it is winter. And um, I got to thinking about the first time I was in Carroll Stream. It was 1970. It was between semesters of college. And I hadn't really found a job for the summer. And if I intended to go back to school, I needed one. So I did find eventually something delivering phone books in Carroll Stream. And uh, I was given, uh, a realtor gave me a map and the, some of the streets were marked off. But quite frankly, once you went north of North Avenue, it was mostly construction sites and uh, open fields and a few, quite a few farm fields, as a matter of fact. But I eventually managed to do the job. So that was in 1970. Something else happened in 1970 that I think more people need to know about. Since 1970, various organizations have estimated that North America has lost roughly one out of four birds. Now it's not equally distributed among species. Some species are doing better than others, but in general, we have 25% um, fewer birds in North America than we had back in 1970 when I was delivering phone books in Carroll Stream. Question might come up, why feed the birds? Well, I've thought about this. I know I have a very good friend who uh, belongs to uh, uh, a native plant society who has arguments against feeding the birds. I think feeding the birds is a good idea, especially in the winter, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. First of all, most of the time when we feed birds, we're only complementing what they're finding to eat anyway. We may be supplementing it, and sometimes, very rarely, very rarely, do birds come to rely on our feeders and what we're feeding them replaces what the birds would normally be eating. Why winter? Well, it's resource scarcity and more. Uh, incidentally, I, I, most of the photographs tonight, I think maybe in this presentation, all of them I've taken 
<clears throat> excuse me, many of them, if not most of them, in my own backyard. And I've tried to identify birds. And if you have a question about a particular species, I'll try to answer it. The birds in this photograph, I think this was the second time I've ever seen them in Page County. Once in my backyard when I lived in Lombard, and once several winters ago uh, on a day not too different from today here in my house in Glen Ellet. These are red poles. They're a northern species related to the goldfinches that many of you are familiar with. And, you know, I, it was a matter of disbelief for me to see them. Um, is there a problem with sound? No sound. I can hear you, John. You're good. Okay. No, we hear you fine. Okay. I'll go back to uh, play. So let's, why winter? Well, the breeding season, when most of us see birds, you know, the nice months to be out around here, it's just really a small part of a bird's year. A majority of the bird's year is spent in migration or on winter range. I mean, I have a whole program about um, migration. Towards the, end, towards the end of the winter season, the birds are beginning to get in shape for the breeding season. And of course, during this time, natural resources are depleted by human development and the introduction of non-native plants. So let, I wanna stress this again, adult birds spend the majority of their lives either preparing for migration, they're migrating, or they're on their non-breeding ranges. We'll call them winter ranges. So here's a familiar bird, the dark-eyed junco. They used to be called slate-colored juncos. They're a sparrow. Uh, they're winter, uh, they belong to one of the four categories I've put these birds into. There's the winter visitors. There's the permanent uh, residents. Migrants during the late fall, early winter, and then migrants during late fall, early spring. And then of course, we do have birds that come here just for the breeding season, but I'm not gonna talk about those tonight. But this is a good bird to get to know. It's a ground feeder. Uh, they're about the size of the uh, house sparrows that you probably see. Gray, the males are darker, white. Uh, they can, depending on what's, what it's doing up around Hudson Bay, they may show up as early as September, end of September, and may leave even uh, as late as the beginning of May. You're gonna have a lot of birds that are just passing through. Not everyone straight, uh, stays. The, the birds that come to your feeder attract the migrants. And these migrants may stay a few days before migrating further. And it's a wide range of birds, thrushes, warblers, sparrows, which are, will be attracted to your feeders and blackbirds also. Now this uh, bird, the brown creeper, uh, I like this photograph because if its back was to us, you probably couldn't recognize it. It's very small, smaller than a sparrow. Um, it's a migrant, but I gotta tell you something. From about the middle of October to the middle of December this year, I was uh, in Florida with my wife and we came back literally in the middle of December. Uh, there was still seed in my feeders, uh, I refilled them and a day or two later, some birds showed up and this brown, a brown creeper, not this one, but another one showed up and stayed around for a couple of days. And that's probably the latest I've ever seen one. Now here's a bird a lot of people despise. I'm getting to feel better about it. This is the house sparrow, or most people just call it a sparrow. This is the male, this is a resident bird. It's gonna be, often the very first bird is going to show up at your feeder if you start when you start feeding birds. Um, it's part of a kind of a Eurocentric movement that happened in North America and all areas of culture in the United States in the 1800s. We were Eurocentric and people were bringing in, any bird mentioned in Shakespeare was brought in and most of them died except for one or two species, one of them being the starling. These were introduced to control linen moths. And of course, <clears throat> they did very well, uh, probably did better during the horse and buddy, buggy days than they do now. They tend to thrive around human habitations. 
uh, in Florida at the place we're at, um, we're about a half a mile from a major roadway. We're on a large freshwater lake. I have never seen a house sparrow outside our condo, but all I have to do is go to the shopping mall, the grocery store mall, uh, half mile away, and they're all over the place. They are generalists. They, they'll feed at your feeders, they'll feed on the ground. And they're a good bird to get to know very well because you can compare other birds to them. Bigger than a sparrow, smaller than a sparrow, um, color-wise, marking-wise. So they're a very good bird. And if you're just starting out looking at birds, watching birds, this is one you'll want to get to know. <coughs> birds have big appetites. So their metabolism is higher than ours and they have higher temperatures. In fact, that's why birds can do so well uh, here in the winter. They have higher temperatures as long as they're fed and they have a natural down coat. So they do very well. I kind of like this and I apologize if there's some misogyny showing up here, but we have that expression that eat like a bird. Well, the morning dove, which is a bird that's still around, it shows up at my feeder and it's a ground feeding bird. It weighs about eight pounds, quarter ounce, and it consumes 71 calories. Now, I found this out by Googling it, so don't blame me if I'm off the, you know, off the wall here. My source on Google said the average American woman weighs 170 pounds. That means she would need to eat approximately 85 calories a day if she wanted to eat like a bird. A couple other things about a bird's appetite. Uh, someone pointed this out to me and when I started watching birds a little more closely at my feeders, I found out it's true. They often defecate to reduce their weight before taking flight. <coughs> Excuse me. And as a general rule, the smaller the bird, the higher its metabolism is going to be. You might ask yourself, when will I see them? Um, I'm just generalizing here, so keep that in mind. But some birds, like cardinals, tend to show up at dawn and dusk. Uh, in, at my feeders, this is especially true, although the colder it gets, more likely it is they'll show up later in the day and disappear earlier in the evening. Other birds seem to have preferred meal times. Other birds, especially if peop other people in your neighborhood are feeding birds, may skip visiting your feeder for a few days and visit some others. And again, this is a common local bird, the black-capped chickadee. It's a resident, uh, smaller than a sparrow, it gets its name because it's call, especially the ones we have in our area, it's, one of its calls is chickadee dee 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 dee. If you go southern Illinois, go into Kentucky, Tennessee, and further south and east, it has a relative called the Carolina chickadee, looks almost identical, slightly smaller, and it's chickadee dee 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 dee. So um, I don't know. I guess I would say, if for those of you musicians, our chickadee goes in 4-4 four, four, and the Carolina chickadee goes in 8-8. Eight, eight. What's for dinner? Well, birds have preferences. And I've started out with sunflower because sunflower seeds are widely accepted, widely accepted. And you can buy the hulled variety. They're, they make less mess. I should note, though, that some birds, the chickadee that I just showed you, for example, seem to prefer the hauled kind. Another common grain, if you're buying mixture, is millet. It's a small white seed. And you'll see as, you, as I show pictures of birds in the various uh, uh, feeders, you'll see millet in there. Some birds like peanuts, especially jays. Some of the larger birds that you may or may not want to attract to your feeder, like cracked corn. Uh, the house sparrows like it, crows like it, uh, water birds like it. One year I had a bobwhite quail show up at my feeder and I, I don't think there was cracked corn. She stayed around a few days, but uh, game birds, if you, maybe you still have next to a field or a forest preserve in Carroll Stream, there may be pheasants present. They like cracked corn. Safflower seed. And I put a question mark by Milo. 
big box store blends. If you buy a, a general bird seed, will have Milo seeds in it. It's it's a slightly larger than the millet, and it's kind of a reddish orange. Um, a lot of birds really avoid that. House sparrows like it. Um, like I said, it's a filler. It's used as a filler in a lot of the big box brands, but um, there are birds that will take it. This particular bird that I'm showing in this photograph, the red-breasted nuthatch, is a winter visitor, although I've had them stay as late as early July. And it's smaller than the sparrow. You can see that it has a black stripe through its eye and kind of a white eyebrow. Uh, underneath, they're kind of a rusty color. Uh, the colors on the male, especially as spring approaches, become a little more intense than on this one. Last year, incidentally, there was an invasion, and I had as many as a dozen in my backyard at one time. And believe me, there's nothing special about my backyard. Niger, so it's sometimes sold as thistle, and it's really a favorite of finch, finches. The gold finch, the red pole I showed you, there's a house finch. I'm going to be showing you that. And I didn't mention it here, but a bird called the pine siskin. It's usually so offered in dedicated feeders. And I, right now I'm using a mesh bag. Uh, I also, in one of my feeders, just threw in a couple tablespoons of Niger seed, kind of mix it up for when the goldfinches come. During the winter time, most goldfinches kind of resemble the photograph I have here of a female. The males are perhaps a little darker on the back. As the breeding season approaches, the males, the yellow will intensify, the black will intensify, and they'll get a very distinctive black cap. Safflower flower seed is another seed uh, that you can buy. It's usually not included in any kind of mixture. It's a real favorite of cardinals. And for many years, based on what I'd read in my own experience, I thought it would, cardinals were about the only bird that would accept safflower seeds. I've learned However, that many of its related birds, including things like this rose-breasted grosbeak male, uh, will accept safflower seeds. Incidentally, cardinals are one of the birds that really have extended their breeding range north. Uh, probably it's been uh, hypothesized, I can't even say it now, hypothesized that uh, feeding the birds has attracted them further north then they probably would have occurred. But uh, they're, per, they're, they're residents in our area and uh, I get them, like I said, early in the morning, usually these days before I get up and uh, later in the evening. Sometimes they show up as pairs, sometimes just the male, sometimes just the female. Suet feeders <clears throat> and suet itself are um, a very popular bird food. I, I offered it, I seldom offer it. And part of the reason is because it's usually sold as a seed mixture and the squirrels get to it and uh, do a real number on it. But here, um, this year that I fed it, you can see I got a couple of the insect eating birds would visit it. So we have a downy woodpecker, which is a little bit larger than a sparrow and it's a resident woodpecker, perhaps our most common woodpecker. And there's a male red-breasted grosbeak uh, visiting a suet cake. The other thing you can do is make a substitute from bacon fat, or you know, if you do any kind of fat that you have to drain off and it solidifies, you can mix in seeds or crumbs or just even just the fat alone, and it will attract woodpeckers, nuthatches, and birds like chickadees, very similar birds. Um, you might even want to try if you have a ham bone, hanging the ham bone, uh, that will attract some birds. Also will probably attract some other things you may not want in your garden, but uh, if you want to attract birds, it works. Here's a project that I did once with a group of school children in Clarendon Hills. And I think you might, uh, if you have children, grandchildren, or work with youth groups, it's a kind of a nice project. Uh, you simply take pine cones, these are white pine cones, yeah, I coated them with peanut butter and I rolled it around in bird seed and hung it up. 
Um, I know there's concerns about nut allergy. So actually, when I did it with the Claritin Hills kids, uh, the mothers brought in Crisco and to avoid the peanut allergy. And also you could use uh, lard, any kind of soft fat would work. And there is a problem with this, but it has nothing to do with birds. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So how do you serve the birds in the winter? Well, you don't need fancy bird feeders. You know, just throwing seed on the ground can work. And some birds actually prefer it that way. The junco I showed you before, I don't know how many juncos I've seen, but I've only seen one at a feeder, perched at a feeder, two, three times the most in 50 years. They're always on the ground. Tree sparrows is another sparrow that comes down during the winter. You can see it's, it's about the size of our native, uh, our, the house sparrow, but has some real distinct features. First of all, it's kind of gray underneath. Its top bill is black, its bottom bill is pink, and it has kind of a gray eyebrow. And it doesn't show in this picture, but if you look at the breast, it has a black spot, kind of a stick pin. So many birds prefer to feed on the ground. Um, I've even seen my nuthatches fly to the ground to pick up seeds. Trays are a common way to feed the birds. Uh, and I have a picture of one, next slide, I think. Tube feeders, hopper feeders, and we'll, I'll talk about those in a few moments. Well, here you have a blue jay at a tray feeder. And although I have blue jays in my yard, I almost never have them at my feeder. Part of the reason that I don't have them at my feeder is I don't have a tray feeder. Uh, some of you I know are concerned about feeding the birds spreading diseases. And uh, from what I've read, from what I've learned, uh, the guess, and it's really nothing's been, as far as I can tell, found to be definitively true, but the diseases might be found on the ground and a tray feeder is essentially a ground feeder raised up a few feet. So when you're, when you're placing your feeder, no matter what kind it is, keep in mind, can you see the feeder? I live in an old house. And quite frankly, where I, the best place to put my feeder for the birds means that if I wanna look at them, I have to go to the basement and look out a window. Uh, I've tried putting feeders in other locations and they're not, those other locations just aren't as attractive to birds. Is the location then safe for the birds? Uh, <clears throat> predators and window collisions are concerns. Uh, collisions kill about 100 million birds a year, mostly during migration, mostly in urban areas. The loop, for example, uh, thousands of birds are killed every spring and fall as they migrate through Chicago. And Chicago is actually one of the cities that's kind of in the forefront of turning its lights out or as much as possible during migration. Close to the window is actually safer. About 10 feet uh, is considered good because even if the bird flies to the window, it hasn't picked up enough speed, velocity, so that the impact will do much more than stun it. And placement uh, near shrubs is also a key consideration. Um, evergreens are good. Birds will fly in and out, they feel safer. So these are all factors. That's none of the, you know, the absence of something, you don't have evergreens, you don't have shrubs, don't worry about it. Just put a, you know, start feeding the birds. Sooner or later, birds are gonna start showing up. You might want to consider though how convenient it is to refill. Most of my feeders are located approximately five or six feet off the ground. So I can easily take them down and fill them up. I have a neighbor next door, his feeders are off his upstairs balcony and they're approximately 20 feet off the ground. And he gets, he'll get birds some days that nothing shows up or very little shows up at my feeder, but they're at his. I mentioned predators, you're gonna have some uninvited guests sooner or later. This is a Cooper's hawk, and it's probably in my mind, uh, the most likely natural predator to show up. It's an uncommon bird, 
but they have their populations have been increasing over the years in urban areas. Uh, they're bird specialists. They belong to a group called Accipiters and whose body design uh, helps them fly through wooded areas in pursuit of birds. Uh, at my feeder, morning doves seem to be their preferred prey. A bigger threat are cats, outside cats, feral cats, and a low estimate is that it's estimated that they kill about 1 billion birds a year in the United States. <clears throat> well, as I suggested earlier, there are many designs of bird feeders. One challenge is repelling squirrels. So this feeder in this particular photograph I no longer have, but my son brought it home. He was working in a sandwich shop next to a big pet store and pet store threw this out. And it was designed so that if there were, there was too much weight on the purchase, a cage would slide over the bird seed. Incidentally, what you see in here are sunflower seeds, a few safflower seeds and millet. And um, the birds are kind of an interesting bird I just had one show up yesterday, uh, first one I've seen this year. They're called house finches. They can look very similar to a house sparrow, but the males are usually pink or orange underneath. The females are very sparrow-like birds. And what's interesting about them is they're a Western species, Southwestern United States, West Coast. During the 1930s, a small flock was taken to New York to be sold in the pet trade. Someone informed the pet store owner that he was breaking federal law, so he released them. Well, from that point on, they started to breed and expand their range. So they're in the Chicago area now. I think they get just a little further west of St. Louis, but while they have been expanding their range westward, westward the native west population has been coming east. So sooner or later, I guess they're going to uh, meet. And they're related to the goldfinch. <clears throat> well, you can get all other kinds of designs. I call this design a hopper feeder. I hang it. This particular one could be put on, placed on a four by four post too. Squirrels are very determined little animals. And uh, with this particular feeder, I had to replace the window a couple of times with pieces of plexiglass. Something starts a small hole, might be a woodpecker pecking at it, might be a squirrel gnawing at it. Once a small hole is started, it becomes a bigger hole. And then uh, that defeats the purpose of a squirrel proof feeder. But uh, I just cut a piece of plexiglass, put it in there and it works for a season or two. Now, a determined squirrel did this to one of my feeders. This was another hopper feeder I had. I think there's some kind of karma that went on here. One winter, probably about this time, I remember it had been very cold, and I hadn't been out, literally out of the house for a couple of days, um, taking trash out, and I realized I hadn't been seeing birds. I said, I wonder if there's seed in the feeder. So I went up to this particular feeder, and I could see there was something inside. I could see it was a squirrel. When I opened it, sure enough, there was a squirrel, a very, very, very dead squirrel. It was frozen solid. Uh, it had managed to open the feeder, get inside, and get locked inside the feeder. So, uh, I mean, that was a fluke, but I mean, sooner or later, a squirrel's gonna try to get into your feeder, and hopefully nothing like this happens, but learn to expect that. Squirrels, squirrels and, and birds incidentally are not a good combination. Squirrels will eat baby birds, they'll eat the eggs. I've seen squirrels uh, gnawing on the body of an adult bird, whether they killed the bird or they found a dead bird and were scavenging, scavenging it, I don't know. But uh, squirrels will uh, become predators on birds. Now here's a few more designs. Uh, there's another hopper feeder in the lower right. In the upper right is currently my favorite squirrel proof feeder. The only problem I've ever had with it was last year. There was a 
very small gray squirrel that got in, was able to get into it. Um, I whacked it a couple of times to get it out and uh, haven't seen it this year. Of course, the one on the left is something, again, you can do as a project with children. Uh, most plastic bottles can be converted into some kind of bird feeder and birds will accept them. Literally an hour after I put this one up, I had chickadees at it. That being said, squirrels love to chew on it. But uh, again, you can, you can make them out of plastic bottles. I guess the iffy thing is that you do need something very sharp to get uh, cut out the plastic. Although perhaps an adult can make a few cuts with a utility knife and kids can cut the rest of it out with scissors. If you go online to YouTube and you enter, you know, homemade bird feeders or plastic bottle bird feeders, you're going to see scores of videotapes on YouTube about this. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you're going to see. I'm the program I might have presented to you in the past was based on my having seen approximately 100 species of birds. It's more now in my yard. And uh, Certainly one of the things that encourages visitors are my bird feeders. Now, some of them are going to be regulars. You're going to see them every day or, you know, at least once or twice a week. Others are going to be sporadic. I showed you a picture of the red poles. They certainly were sporadic. Time of year has an impact on birds. You know, I wouldn't expect to see, um, well, I wouldn't expect to see a gross speak in my yard right now. In a couple months, not so much of a surprise. Bottom line is birds have wings and they don't read books. So don't be surprised what you might attract. I, I have seen, I mentioned earlier, I've, I've had bobwhite quail at my feeder. Um, there are probably three or four species of birds, if I look very carefully at my records, that I have only seen in my yard, including uh, uh, a big brother to a big cousin to the uh, Cooper's hawk called a Merlin uh, that visited once just for a few minutes and flew on. Especially if you have large trees in your neighborhood or you're close to a forest preserve, you're going to see this guy. Excuse me, a red bellied woodpecker. Uh, this is another mostly southern, mostly eastern species that has expanded its range. And it's the most common or second most common res a woodpecker in our area. During the breeding season, the males do have kind of a pinkish tinge underneath. Uh, bird feeding has nothing to do with their range. I mean, they, they've somehow just started expanding and they're replacing the native red-headed woodpecker, which if you have one of those in your yard, Congratulations, that's, that's quite a bird to spot in general in DuPage County anymore. This is the largest sparrow you're probably going to see in your yard. It's only slightly smaller than a robin. It's called an eastern towhee. Uh, the males look very similar to this one, only the uh, back is much darker black, the sides a little more intense. This photo is particularly fuzzy because I took it through my basement window. So I was shooting through uh, two panes of glass, but I didn't want to risk going out in the yard and scaring it off. But it stayed around for a couple of days, eating the bird seed that fell out of the other uh, feeders. I mentioned sporadic visitors. The day this showed up, first of all, I couldn't believe I saw it. Secondly, I couldn't believe it actually stayed while I ran in the house, got a camera and came outside. This is a slightly bigger relative of this chickadee. It's called a tough tit mouse. You can see it has a crest. And um, they breed in DuPage County. They're found in DuPage County. They are, their preferred habitat would be, habitat would be oak woodlands. So I've seen them in uh, Winfield at, uh, I think it's called West Branch Forest Preserve place called Elson's Hill. Uh, this one again came for just a day or two and then went away and I haven't seen one since in my yard. 
Now, I showed you a male rose-breasted grosbeak. This is a young male rose-breasted grosbeak that showed up uh, in late fall. And uh, you can see it's a much drabber looking bird, but it has that really characteristic heavy bill like a cardinal. And um, again, this is another bird that got photographed through the basement window. This bird probably won't show up at your feeder because of your feeder. It will show up in your yard if birds are visiting your feeder. This is a relative of a robin called a gray cheeked -cheek thrush. It's a migrant. They'll show up in spring and fall, and uh, they're very shy. Um, I'm trying to think how to compare it to a robin. I mean, a robin, robins are really used to us. We've created the ideal robin habitat in our suburbs with our uh, golf courses and our forest preserves and what have you. Uh, this is a northern bird. It prefers a more wooded area, a more uh, coniferous wooded area. This is another bird from that same region that will show up in your yard. It may show up at your feeder. It eats seeds. It also eats suet, the golden crown kinglet. Uh, the males have the orange red crown. You see just a little bit of it in this photograph. It's a very small bird, probably next to hummingbirds. It's the second smallest bird you're likely to see in DuPage County. The males, uh, the females uh, crown is yellow. Another kinglet that comes a little bit earlier and stays a little bit later is called the, uh, why can't I think of its name now? Slip my mind. It's a kinglet. Uh, it has a couple uh, white eye ring and it has no crown like this. It's just kind of a olive green bird, ruby crown kinglet. It does have, the males have a tiny ruby crown that's almost never seen. Now you might be asking yourself, is it too late? Is January too late to put out <laughs> bird feeders? And I would say no. Uh, it may take a little bit longer for birds to find your feeder. Um, but sooner or later, something will show up. It's important that you, <coughs> excuse me, try to keep your feeders full. And it's also important that you try to keep your keep feeders clean. I know some of you have heard about diseases. Um, I know there was concern this summer because in the east and towards the south, a lot of birds were dying and it was called mysterious a disease and uh, some, some attention was paid to bird feeding and there are diseases that are spread, that can be spread at bird cedar feeders. Although I've seen very little evidence of this. We'll talk a little bit more about that next slide. Um, what I finally heard, uh, yeah, the, for, first of all, the, our Department of Natural Resources, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources did not report any mysterious bird deaths. Uh, there was some speculation, and this seemed possible to me, that birds were feeding on the cicadas that were emerging in those area areas because their range, you know, the range of the die-offs and the range of emergence uh, coincided, and that the cicadas had built up pesticides in their bodies. The birds were eating the um, cicadas, and the pesticides were concentrating in the birds. You know, the same thing happened. Uh, many years ago with DDT. Uh, Rachel Carson, of course, wrote about that silent spring. <clears throat> so there are some steps to uh, feeder hygiene. First of all, dirty feeders spread diseases. So you want to try to keep them clean. The first thing, though, is to make sure your seed hasn't gotten wet and rancid. And uh, I have to confess that a couple years ago, I realized birds weren't coming to one of my feeders. And what had happened is like, maybe the bottom inch or two, the lowest level had gotten wet and uh, fungus had grown and it was just like a solid block. So I had to clean it out. Um, a good recommendation is that you scrub your uh, feeders, soak them if possible in uh, warm water and vinegar rinse in plain water and then make sure it's dry before refilling and to wash your hands. Some bird diseases, salmonella for example, can be transferable to humans. 
all that being said, the bird group that seems to be most affected by diseases are the finches, house finches, especially gold finches, uh, pine, pine siskins also are affected, gold finches to a lesser extent. Um, and then the red pole I showed you is a type of finch. Um, and it seems to be birds that feed on the ground get those diseases. So if it's possible, try relocating your feeders. Um, like I said, I've never heard anyone report uh, diseases here in DuPage County. That doesn't mean there haven't been any. It simply means I haven't heard about any. Come on, go. Okay, and speaking of finches, here's a pine siskin. This bird will show up in a flock, sometimes a small flock of maybe half a dozen birds, sometimes in very large flocks. Um, they have a very sharp, sharp bill, and you can see they're, they have that yellow on their wings, and that's, that is one of the key identifying things. But if you're going to keep up, a, uh, put up feeders, you're going to become a true bird watcher. You know, I belong to the Page Birding Club, and I, I'm going to generalize and say there's a lot of people in the birding club who really don't watch birds. They walk around, and my wife, who's not a birder or bird watcher by any means, pointed this out. They see something, they check it off on the list, and they keep walking. When you have a bird feeder up, you're going to be watching birds, and you're going to be observing behavior. You're going to be, you're going to be seeing individuals. You'll learn to recognize individuals. You'll learn that some birds have some preferences. You'll learn that, for example, as I have, the female cardinal always seems to be deferent to the male cardinal. Um, Quite often the female will show up before the male. And if she's at the feeder, he'll come to the feeder, she'll go to the ground and feed on what falls off. <coughs> so you're gonna become a bird watcher. And if you do, I wanna urge you to think about becoming a citizen scientist. Sci our, the scientists, the ones who came up with the, I, you know, the, the, the realization we've lost so many birds, the ones who are studying diseases. Uh, depend on people like us reporting their observations. And there are several good ways to do this. Cornell University has the Laboratory of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. And the Laboratory of Ornithology runs a, a website called ebird.org. Now you do have to register, but once you register, <clears throat> you can record your sightings. And I, I do this every day if I'm, on a field trip, naturally, I record those sightings. But, you know, 85% of the time, I haven't gone anywhere to look at birds. I'm looking at birds out my window, or um, my wife is a musician, and she's done concerts in parks, and I've made lists of birds that I've seen in parks, and I put them on eBird. There's also something called Project Feeder Watch that's run through eBird, or through the Lab of Ornithology. You do have to pay to participate, but what you do is uh, you record your observations at feeders for a certain, uh, during a certain uh, length of time and on a, a more or less regular basis. But, you know, because thousands of people are doing this, the scientists are collecting data that help them see trends and spot trends. <coughs> Another organization that I just this last year became part of and am really enthusiastic about is iNaturalist. And especially if you're a photographer, you might want to uh, look into this. Again, you set up an account and then you post pictures, not just of birds. Uh, obviously, you're a gardening club. You like plants. You can post, post pictures of plants. In fact, uh, because I don't know plants as well as I'd like. Uh, when I'm out in the field doing work, I'll photograph something and post it on iNaturalist, and they have algorithms that can help you identify the plant, at least down maybe to the family, if not to the genus and species. Uh, and that people are using that to do their research projects. So both of those are good organizations. And I don't need to tell you this, but in fact, I'm glad to hear you're having a program. They're not bugs, they're bird food. And um, 
you're an organic garden club, uh, maybe you're aware that many, many, many of the plants that we grow for our ornamental purposes are non-native. What that means is that there are few native insects that feed on the plants. And that means there's those native insects provide food for birds. Um, moths especially are an important source of uh, bird food during spring migration. And um, two things happen when they come, come into our suburbs and they see things like ginkgo and calorie pear and Norway maple and who knows what all, uh, or the pest resistant buns, that, uh, plants. That's another one that's kind of an interesting challenge to bird life because the moths, the insects aren't on the leaves. So the birds do one of two things. If they're lucky, they can make it to a natural area where they will find the insects they need or they die, they die. So, but I don't need to, I'm preaching to the choir with this one, I think. So a couple of suggestions. If you want more information, uh, if you go to the Page Birding Club and that's our website, <clears throat> there's a bunch of bro brochures <coughs> that we've put on there. Uh, they're PDFs, you're free to print them out. You're free, your club's free to print out them and uh, make multiple copies and distribute them. Uh, the Bird Club also has a Facebook page called the Page Burning Club. I have a personal natural history play page uh, called John's Natural DuPage. Uh, DuPage and, uh, that's a little discombobulated. It's so whatever nature related thing at the moment catches, captures my attention. But uh, I wanna thank you again for inviting me. And uh, I, hope, I hope you picked up a tip or two. And uh, you know, if you have questions, I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Uh, I taught, <laughs> never taught regularly at Glen Bar North, but when I used to go to Glen, I taught for District 87. So I can remember when Glen Bard North was in the middle of fields. Uh, but uh, so I've taught for a long, long, taught high school and college for a long time, 50 years. So I've gotten very good at lying and covering if I don't know the answer, but I'll try to give you a straight answer to your questions tonight. Well, thank you so very much, John. Um, that was awesome. And we do have a few questions. I think some of them you might've touched base on in the, in the you know after they put the question in but i'll just go ahead and read a couple of the comments and and uh one is more of a comment than a question and that was uh regarding the squirrels uh squirrel barrels are great but you have to get them high enough uh, mine is over five feet from the ground and also need to be away from my tree or fences so they don't jump and so Again, it's more of a statement. Right. And then the question, um, can birds get sick from drinking from bird baths? And how often do you clean bird feeders or bird baths? I've written a book, and now I'm looking for a publisher. And one whole chapter is devoted to watching the bird bath in my backyard. And um, once the weather gets warm, bird baths are a good way to attract birds. Uh, I'm in an old house. I don't have, it's not convenient for me to set up a bird bath in the winter and put one of the heaters in. But believe me, if you do, you'll probably see more birds than just with feeders alone. All that being said, the question's very good. So here's what I do. I have two bird baths, both, one of them I bought from a now defunct bird store. And it's essentially a large shallow plastic, uh, like a saucer in a rather nice uh, steel, uh, what do you call it? Uh, just a stand. And then I took, I went to, let's see, your Carol Stream Lowe's. Let's go to Lowe's. You get the largest uh, plant saucer you can buy and you buy a tomato cage and you can play around with it. What I've done is, uh, cut the legs off the potato cage and turn it upside down and put the saucer on top of that. So it's similar to the one I bought and a lot less expensive. I keep them full during the summer. I try to go out every other day and scrub them 
because especially the one the one is in the sun for a good part of the day and you get algae growing so i give it a good scrubbing sometimes you know, sometimes i use bleach a weak solution of bleach like 10 to 1 uh, sometimes I've used uh, vinegar and water. That seems to be the uh, uh, work just as well, too. Uh, I try to keep them full, but I do check them every day. The problem with me, and this sounds strange, is in the last few years, I go back and forth a lot between here and Florida. And... Um, even in the summer when incidentally when people tell you that the florida the gulf coast is paradise if the gulf coast is paradise in august september october then the distinction between heaven and hell is a lot more subtle than i've been led to believe by my priest but um uh so i you know then i just don't fill them up i figure i don't i don't want the birds getting sick uh, robins will come and bathe and uh, a lot of birds just come to drink. Robins will come to bathe. And, you know, I know I have to change the water if I see robins in the bird bath because it's going to be a muddy mess. Um, sparrows will come and bathe and drink. A lot of other birds will just come and drink. So I try to keep it as clean as possible. Um, and, you know, I didn't talk about that. I'll just mention that the other thing uh, is... Um, Hummingbird feeders. Some of you probably put up hummingbird feeders and you make your own uh, nectar out of a quarter cup of sugar and a cup of water. I try to clean those out every two or three days, <clears throat> partly because the sugar water will start to ferment. Now, I was really uh, surprised to learn that even nectar will ferment in a flower. So, um, I don't know if that's a big concern. I've had hummingbirds, seen hummingbirds at a feeder uh, shortly before I've decided to change it. And I can tell you that, you know, the, the nectar had started fermenting. On the other hand, I have someplace on one of my computers, I have a photograph I took in uh, Maryland of some robins in a berry patch and the robins were drunk. And they were drunk because the berries had started to ferment. And uh, the photograph I like best, the robin is literally tipsy. So things to consider. Yeah, now these are not actually, um, these are related to this uh, and uh, what, pe what other people do. So one person uses a small heated dog bowl that they plug in for winter. The birds seem to like it. Um, and, um, then John was saying salt is a good cleaning agent for algae and general cleaning. Apply heavy salt, moist but not wet, and use a stiff brush to clean the water tray. We have such a wealth of information here. Thank you. Um, and then Nancy was saying that it's she has doves in her heated bird bath in the winter, um, like their own little hot tub, and they just sit on the edge with their feet in the water for a long time, and it's just fun to watch. But we do have other questions, so. I, I want to say something, as long as we're talking about bird bath. Okay. I, I went to a dollar store and I bought the largest dog dish I could find. And I keep that filled with water by the bird bath. The reason is at night during the summer months, possums or raccoons will go up into the bird bath and tip it over. And uh, that means in the morning, you know, before I get out, get out there and do something about it, Birds are coming to the bird because birds are creatures of habit. Birds will come to the bird bath, and there's no bird bath. Um, I especially think I get raccoons because let me tell you, many days the water in that dog bowl is a muddy mess, and I know raccoons wash their food. So, uh, but that's something I do. I like that dog, uh, that eat a dog bowl idea. Um, I'm gonna have to include that sometime. Um, yeah, that I, I don't have the electricity outlets in my house to, to do much like that, though. Yeah. So here's a question. Um, I've heard owls in the middle of the night for a few months. What do they eat other than rodents? 
skunks, cats, you know, um, small rodents are preferred. Um, yeah, actually, um, the great horned owl, which is probably the most common owl in our area, we're going into their breeding season right now. And uh, you're surprised, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not surprised anymore, but when, uh, you know, I'm sitting in my basement here in Glen Ellen, and uh, I'm like halfway between the train and Roosevelt Road in one of the older parts of Glen Ellen. And uh, I've heard owls this time of year, right through February, sitting in my basement. They're in, they're in the area. I have a photograph of one that was in a tree a few years ago. Um, there's also screech owls that show up from time to time. But uh, yeah, someone asked one time about attracting owls to your yard. And I don't know of any surefire method unless you have a large property and you can put up for screech owls rather large bird boxes. Uh, you're more than likely to get squirrels and similar mammals to use the, the nest boxes, but screech owls do use bird boxes. And again, a Google search will provide you with a wealth of information and dimensions and that sort of thing. Okay, I do have another question. I missed this one um, before. How fresh do any types of seed or grains need to be? If bird feed is old, will it be too stale to attract birds? How long will seed stay usable? A season. You know, uh, and I'm basing that on what birds accept. So I, uh, I have thistle seed. I have it hanging. Um, I put it out shortly. I want to say the end of October, and I had a couple goldfinches visiting my yard. Um, the goldfinches haven't shown up since I came back in December. I haven't seen them yet this year. It may be a matter of timing. They may they they tend to form large flocks, so um, perhaps uh, they've gone to some of the open areas around here. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, quite frankly, when I have old seed, it's I, I, I just feed during out the year. So I'll throw it out during the summer. And uh, the birds don't get it, the squirrels and mice do. Um, I read a woman today said that she goes through 20 pounds of seed a week. And so uh, I don't think she has that issue. I probably, Right now I have three seed feeders and uh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to give a good guesstimate. I've probably gone through 40 or 50 pounds of seed already, but this is starting back in October. And uh, I'm gonna fill the feeders up once more because uh, we're leaving in a few days for a while down in Florida. So my wife can play some concerts and uh, uh, the birds will have seed if they want it. You know, they're like your children, you know, I get, I never put cheese on my kids' broccoli to make them eat it, but I guess parents do that now. Um, can't make a bird eat if it doesn't want to eat, so. Thanks, we have another question. Um, a Cooper Hawk is a pretty regular guest. Um, but we've also had a slightly smaller hawk with bluish colored wings and lighter body. Any idea what that was? <clears throat> I'm going to mention some species and the person asking this question, uh, I would invite you to go to um, All About Birds, which is another program or uh, site run by the Laboratory of Ornithology. Uh, first of all, adult Cooper's hawks, 
the, well, the female is larger than the male, sometimes noticeably so. So it could be uh, a male. Uh, also, I think the young birds, for whatever reason, seem to be larger and they have a slightly different pattern. There is also another species of hawk that's almost identical in appearance to the Cooper's hawk. There's slight differences in the tail uh, silhouette called a sharp shinned hawk. Most of them migrate through DuPage County, uh, but it's altogether possible that you have one hanging out. Finally, there's a small falcon called a kestrel or sparrow hawk. And um, they're one of the birds, incidentally, I used to see them regularly, no matter where I went looking for birds in DuPage County. And uh, I don't see them on a regular basis anymore, um, but they're a resident bird. Incidentally, falcons in some books are placed in, uh, <clears throat> in the group raptors with hawks and vultures and uh, those birds. But uh, latest genetic studies show that falcons are actually most closely related to parrots, parakeets. So that's kind of an interesting thing to know about. It is, thank you. All right, um, another question. Will feeding birds with thistle seed result in an overabundance of thistle weeds growing in the yard? No, because thistle seed is not, they call it thistle seed and it's not thistle, it's Niger, it's an African plant. It won't, uh, it won't germinate. I've tried. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, I am careful. I have thistle in my yard and uh, I allow one or two plants to grow. I let the milkweed grow wherever it wants to grow. And uh, the goldfinches are kind of an interesting bird because they, they are, they like thistle a lot. They like to eat the thistle seed. They like the insects that feed on thistle and they use the thistle down when it goes to seed uh, to make their nest. And so they tend to breed later in the summer than other birds in our area. So now thistle is an important plant for, real thistle is an important plant for goldfinches. But the Niger seed I was talking about, that's an African species. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's why they use it. Thank you. Um, and then this one is not bird related, but has anyone seen an increase in black squirrels visiting their yards? We see two almost daily in our yard. Well, aren't you lucky? <laughs> I have not. The only black squirrels I've seen are at uh, Lyman Woods in Downers Grove. Okay, and then I have a question. Um, is there any way to attract more colorful birds like the Eastern Bluebird or Tanger? Or something like that. I have like fruits and nuts and sunflower seeds, but it seems like the sparrows just eat that up and pay an extra for it. And I'm wondering if it's a waste of time trying to attract them. Okay, the birds you mentioned, <clears throat> Orioles. Orioles, yeah, summer. Anagers, bluebirds. Um, there, once upon a time, actually it was in the early part of the 20th century, there was an amateur ornithologist named Benjamin Galt who um, ended his days here in Glen Ellen. In fact, if you go down Main Street, north between, uh, I can't think of street names now. It's on the, it's north of downtown Glen Ellen on Main Street on the east side of the street, there's a kind of a stream they let running and they call it the Benjamin Galt Bird Sanctuary. Um, the intention was to make it a much bigger uh, bird preserve, but uh, real estate developers got to it first. So that's basically two house lots, small house lots. And I'm saying that because I've looked at his bird records and a lot of birds that are common now, Canada geese, robins, cardinals, were very unusual birds, uh, say prior to the 1930s. <clears throat> and 
And of course, what we've done as we've suburbanized the area, we've made it more attractive to those birds. In the case of bluebirds, um, if you go to the forest preserves, almost every forest preserve has in DuPage County has dedicated bluebird houses. And they're put up because the ideal size for a bluebird house is also the ideal size for starlings, house sparrows, which are non-native birds, and um, tree swallows, which are native birds. I've actually seen black-capped chickadees drive uh, a pair of bluebirds out of a nest box at Lincoln Marsh in Wheaton. So what you generally need for uh, bluebirds is kind of a shrubby area with open fields and a lot of birdhouses. And re part of the reason for a lot of birdhouses is that, especially in the forest preserves, they're going to, birdhouses are going to attract tree swallows. But tree swallows are highly territorial when it comes to nest sites. So a tree swallow will not let other tree swallows nest in a nearby nest box. And that lets the bluebirds blue come in. Uh, outside of nest boxes and water and being in you know, good bluebird habitat, uh, I don't know too much that I would guarantee you're gonna get them to come into your yard. Orioles tend to nest in mature, fairly open oak woodland. Now they will come and visit Orioles and, uh, did I say Orioles? I meant tanagers. Tanagers, that's their preferred habitat. And, um, you know, in terms of food, they, they, they tend to be insectivorous um, for a while. And I, you know, it depends. The people who classify birds move these things around. For a while, our tanagers were uh, decided, it was decided they weren't true tanagers. They were placed in the same group with uh, cardinals and grosbeaks. Uh, I don't know how I would guarantee it except nest sites, which would be relatively mature oak trees, water. Uh, they will eat fruit. They'll eat fruit. Orioles during the breeding season uh, will visit and drink orange juice. They like oranges. They like fruits in general. Um, most of the Orioles that I see on a regular basis in the county are nesting in tall trees adjacent to water. So um, for example, I see them along the DuPage rivers, both the, west, both the west branch and the east branch. I've seen them uh, here in Glen Ellen at Lake Ellen. Uh, there's a couple small forest preserves. Um, during migration, the oranges might attract them. So I, Wendy, I don't know what else you're doing. I mean, th those are tr attractive birds. They do show up, um, but not reliably. You know, that's all I can say. It's not reliably. It's, uh, you know, Thank you're you. me talk. I'm trying to remember the last time I've actually in my yard seen uh, tanagers or orioles. But all I have to do is go less than a mile in several directions and I can fi find them if I want, but I'm in a forest preserve. You know, yeah. you know, I, you. You know I, I really, I really, when I talk about attracting birds and I've done a lot of programs and there's many variations of what I showed you tonight. Um, I, I, I really stress the importance of planting native trees and going native. Uh, I got a thank you, that's nice. Thank you for contributing, that's nice, sir. And then I got ignored by uh, a local plan here in Glen Ellen. They want to replace trees downtown and half the trees, over half the trees in terms of species and individuals were non-native. A very large local independent arboretum had recommended these trees. And so I get that some non-native trees are good for a urban environment, but I saw it as an opportunity to plant native trees and think in terms of neighborhoods, not just your yard. 
Your yard's a good place to start. Your neighbor's yard's a good place to continue. But if you can get the community to be serious about planting native trees in the boulevards and in parks and, <coughs> excuse me, and leaving, leaving open areas open, that's great for the birds. It's great for the birds and insects. You know, that's a whole other program about the insect apocalypse that we're experiencing in uh, the developed world. I can, tell you, I can tell you where I am in Florida, which has a reputation for being buggy. There are almost no insects when you go out. I look at the flowers. Most of them are non-native, but so are honeybees. I don't see bees visiting any of the flowers. I don't see butterflies. I don't see moths. Why? Because a couple of times a week we have, I'm in an HOA community. We have uh, people coming through spraying. You know, and no one's interested in changing that. So here's what it is down there, I guess. So somebody else asked, um, what has been the most unusual bird that you have seen both in Glen Ellen and in Florida? When Glen Ellen, what's unusual in Glen Ellen is kind of common in Florida. <laughs> um, I have seen from my yard, I'm about a little less than a mile from the East Branch, and I've seen bald eagles and ospreys flying over my yard. Those are backyard birds where I am in Florida. I see ospreys every day. Uh, I'm seeing eagles more frequently down there. Um, most common bird the last year or so we're on a lake has been the snowy egret. Here in Glen Ellen, I've seen a snowy egret once at East Branch Forest Preserve. Uh, because of eBird, I'm on a rare bird alert list. And uh, <clears throat> those rose breasted gross beaks I saw you, showed you, when they show up in Collier County, which is where Naples and Marco Island is, and some of those communities, Golden Gate, when there's a Rose-breasted grosbeak seen in Collier County. It's on the rare bird alert list. Um, I've gotten really involved in nature photography. And so we were at a park along the uh, Gordon River last November. And I saw a bird up in the air that I thought was a vulture. And I just took a photograph because I wasn't seeing much else. When I got home, and I downloaded the photo because I use a camera, not a phone. I downloaded the photo into my uh, photos on my computer and I blew up the photo and it was a bird called a short tail hawk, which is very, very, very unusual and rare. And don't you know, once I learned to recognize them, I saw them two or three times before I left. So um, in my own yard, excuse me, my own yard, boy, The Merlin I mentioned was really unusual. Um, the quail, I have friends working for both uh, US Fish and Wildlife, the Forest Preserve, Department of Natural Resources. And as far as they know, no one in DuPage County is legally keeping Bob White quail. You gotta get a permit for that. And uh, a day or two before I saw it, someone else had seen it a few blocks from my house. Uh, Maybe it was someone's pet. I don't know. Uh, the red pole I showed you, that's kind of an unusual bird. The, the tough tip mouse was an unusual bird. I mean, I consider those all good birds to show up. And, uh, but uh, it's kind of my motto now. Birds have wings and they don't read books. I'm not really surprised too much by what I see. I'm excited, but, you know, uh, Hummingbirds are showing up in, in Cook County in January. Not ruby-throated hummingbirds, but rufous hummingbirds, which are a southwestern bird. And uh, there's no clear understanding how in January a hummingbird shows up in Oak Park. But a few years, one did and stayed all winter. Very. 
Well, thank you so much. This has been a very wonderful, your slides were absolutely amazing. I think that's all the questions we have. If anybody wants to save the chat, there's other comments in there. You can do so by clicking the three little dots and then click save chat and it'll save on your computer somewhere. And I just wanted, um, so thank you again. Really appreciate um, you coming out, John. And um, thank you to the Carol Stream Library. And once again, I'd like to mention that this is our time of year where we have our membership, uh, annual membership is due uh, $15 per fam, <clears throat> excuse me, $15 per family. And I'm putting a link in the chat again um, for you, for anybody if you're interested and you can um, see that also on our website. It pays for programs like this. Uh, although the, the library also helps us with that, but it also pays for programs um, that, like we do yard tours and things like that in the summer. So, uh, and other activities. So, that sounds uh, like a bargain. Yeah. $30 a family. Well, it's 50 for getting. <laughs> for family so that's pretty pretty a uh, pretty good deal and it helps support a wonderful cause so thank you well thank you for having me I, again i invite people to uh visit the page birding club website their facebook page you can visit my natural uh, my john's natural du page um one of these days if you really want to hear me get on my high horse uh i have a whole whole presentation about why bird bird watching opportunities are better in northeastern Illinois than in southwestern Florida, but uh, that's that's another time. And again, yeah. I, I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing. I I know organic gardening is a very important thing. I have a young friend uh, who went to high school with my one of my sons and was friends with um, my daughter, and I know he's very involved in uh, sustainable act, uh, act gardening and uh, activities. So uh, I appreciate what you're doing through your organization. And I wish you a lot of luck. And anytime you want a program, you could suggest a topic and I'll look at my photos and uh, see if I can put something together for you. Wonderful, thank you so much. And um, it was, yes. So thank you, Laura, just answered that question. The recording will be posted at the library's YouTube channel probably next week. So um, that's the answer for the recording. So thank you, John, for allowing us thank to you. record you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Good evening. Have a good and healthy new year. Uh, you know, wear your mask. Yes. <laughs>